My name is Andrea Bumstead and I am a member at Restore Temecula. If you are new, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in. We believe the church is not an event, but a family that you belong to. So we would love the opportunity to connect with you. If you want to learn more about our church or if we can help in any way, please visit our website at www.RestoreTemecula.com and click on contact. We also have a mobile app with resources, including our Sunday messages, information about upcoming events, and other ways to connect. You can download our app on the Apple or Android App Store. With all of that said, we hope you enjoy the message. Good morning, friends. Merry Christmas. It's good to be with you. All of you. I can see all of your faces. I'll make contact with every single one of you during the course of this message. <laughs> awesome. My name's Herrick. If I've had a chance to meet you, I'm one of the pastors here, along with Tom. And uh, if you're new, last week we had a wonderful Christmas party. Thank you to everyone who helped make that possible. Really grateful. It's a fun week. And, uh, and we're back. So we're going to continue this morning our series, which is called The King in His Kingdom. And we're in week three, actually. The first couple of weeks, it was a kind of an, an Advent mini-series. And we're going to continue kind of looking at the Christmas story for at least the next week or two. And basically, The King in His Kingdom, just like the title suggests, it's all about Jesus being king and what life is like in his kingdom. We're going to be working through the Gospel of Matthew for the next three to ten years, give or take. And we'll see kind of where we go. But there's something I think really important about spending time with Jesus, just journeying with him, learning from him. I'm really excited to do that with you guys. And so I am going to pray, and then I'm going to kick us off for this morning. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. Just the day after Christmas, just thinking about all of the kind of hustle, bustle, the from one place to another, the, all the schedule kind of anxiety, all the things that came with, with this Christmas season, um, I, just, I thank you that it's really all about him. I think it's about him. It's so simple. There's a, there's a present that was delivered to us, Jesus. The gift that the world needed. And I thank you for that. And I thank you that this morning we kind of get to unpack that. What that gift really is. What it means to be a people whose lives are centered on Jesus. And that brings hope and joy and light into this, door, this world which is often so dark. So I love you. I pray that you'd help me this morning. I pray that you'd speak through me. I pray that you would help us, each of us, hear what you want to say to each of us individually. So yeah, so we love you and we thank you. And it's your something we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I think uh, one of the great discoveries of the last two years for me has been a TV show called The Crown. Are there any Crown fans in the house? Yes. Yep. This is not an explicit endorsement because I can't quite do that from the front, but it's pretty good. And there's a lot of um, just interesting and ex very interesting things that, that go down in that show. If you've never watched it, basically the show is really simple. Actually, it's really complex. It's, a, um, <laughs> it's, it's the crown. So it's the, the Queen of England, her family, essentially, the House of Windsor. And it goes back. It's like, I think the queen is about 100 years old now. So I think this kind of picks up when she's like in her 20s. So we get to see her through the decades. And so season four, has anybody watched anything out of season four at this point? Yeah. It, so Princess Diana shows up. If you guys are, I think most of you will know who she is. For those of you guys who do not know who she is, she was, before social media, she was like social media before social media. I mean, she was just everywhere. And so she, I'm actually not going to talk about her today, but uh, it's that season where Princess Diana shows up. I don't know why I'm teasing about this stuff. <laughs> There's an episode in that season, so Diana's in it, but I'm not going to talk about her. Um, I'm going to talk about Margaret Thatcher's son, actually. And if you don't know who Margaret Thatcher is, she was the prime minister, she was the boss, and uh, I think that's what they called her, kind of like the boss back in the day. And she was the prime minister of England back in the, uh, at least in the 80s. And she had a son uh, whose name is Mark Thatcher. And on the show, we get to kind of get to know him a little bit through one of these episodes. And it's an episode where we kind of see the whole royal family. And I've actually used that episode in the past from a previous message, but we're not going to talk about the royal family specifically, the sons and the daughter of, of the queen, but we're going to talk about Margaret Thatcher and her son. 
Her son, Mark, is a remarkable human being in a lot of ways. He, he's the son of a very famous person. So he was born with kind of privilege, power, influence. And he got to do things that most people don't get to do. Has anybody ever heard of the, the race, the Le Mans race? Yeah. yeah. There's a few um, race fans in the house. So Le Mans is a 24-hour, like, endurance race. I see some nodding and a lot of... Yes, it's a 24-hour endurance race. It's really uh, a remarkable kind of, like, long... Actually, I think there was a movie that was based on it, isn't there? The Ford versus Ferrari. Anybody seen that? A lot of movie and TV show references today. But anyway, Mark Thatcher ran that race. He's just kind of a famous person. He's sort of like a Kim Kardashian before Kim Kardashian. What are you famous for? For being famous. Like, he was, that's what he was. He was Margaret Thatcher's son. And he got to run in that race. And so he developed, like, this sense of, like, oh, I can do whatever. I can do whatever now. It's an endurance race. It's a tough race to prep for. And somebody made, like, a passing comment once to him. And they're like, hey, you should really think about doing the, the Paris to Dakar rally. And we have a slide of that. We'll see if we can put it up. If you've never heard of the Paris to Dakar rally, I don't know if you guys could see that, but that's Europe. Up at the top, it's a little bit dark. And that's northern Africa. So up there at the top where the first dot is, is Paris. And then down there at the bottom is Dakar. Anybody know what language that is? It's not Russian. Any guesses? It's actually Bulgarian. Yeah. Thank you, Wikipedia. Yes, Bulgarian is the correct answer. But take a look at that. Take a look at that race. What do you think about traversing that desert? <laughs> How does that sound to you in like a little rally car with two other people over three weeks? Interested or not so interested? Not. It sounds amazing, okay? We've got one, one person. We've got, so <laughs> Mark Thatcher got invited to do this, and he was like, sure. And then he completely forgot about it. Just forgot about it. And in two different retellings of the story, at one point he says, I forgot about it for 18 months. At one point he says, I forgot about it for four months, whatever. The point is, he forgot. And he was, so he wasn't driving the car, and he wasn't the mechanic. He was the person navigating this. And he prepped for half a day the day before this race started. And they took off. What do you think happened to Mark Thatcher's car? Got lost, yeah. You can see where the story is going. Does anybody remember this? Anybody who was around back in the... Yep, yep. Big deal, right? So, the, so in the episode of The Crown, we, kinda, we get this story of what's happening with Mark, Mark Thatcher. He's lost. Totally, utterly, completely lost. The dude didn't even... He took a compass. That's what he took with him. All the technology that was available, and granted, this is before GPS, so there's less technology than that we have now, but there was plenty of technology available, and he took a compass with him, and they got lost. Started to have some car trouble. They ended up getting uh, off track by, I think it was around 30 miles off the actual uh, course. And at the time that they were eventually found, they were 200 kilometers away from where they were supposed to be. But with that said, the story, as the story, as you can imagine, if you're a mother, imagine if your son disappears and your son is gone for a day, two days, out in the, if you could put the, the graphic back up, somewhere in there, your son's gone for three days, for a fourth day, you can't find him, a fifth day, all of a sudden water becomes an issue, food becomes an issue, survival becomes an issue. Six days, he was gone, lost somewhere in that desert. Now eventually, when you have someone as powerful as Margaret Thatcher for mom, or whatever, mom, what happens? People kicking the gear, right? Like a legit rescue operation took place. There was like four airplanes, multiple helicopters. There was, I think, a C-130, which I think at one point we had a C-130 pilot in our church, but if you've ever seen those, there's like four engine planes. Enormous amount of time and energy and money was actually spent to track down Mark Thatcher. They did find him eventually, which is uh, in itself a bit of a triumph. And so the show, it actually picks up with like him back at home after he's been rescued. So I'm just going to read you some of the quotes. This is, in, this is a uh, dramatization, but it's actually really close. 
to the reality based on everything I've read about Mark Thatcher, even some of his own quotes. In the show, he basically says, like, it, well, actually, no, this is a quote. He says, I did absolutely no preparation, nothing. That's what he told the, go- the Guardian. The Guardian? The Guardian? <laughs> I need that coffee. He said, I did a half a day of testing, and a day later we were out driving. Nevertheless, he had plenty of bravado before setting off. He told the BBC, I've raced in Le Mans. This rally is no big deal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and here's, here's where he starts talking. This is him. He said, I was never worried for my life. The others, though, were getting a bit existential. I remained relaxed and treated the time in the desert as a holiday. I even had time to read my book. When we were eventually found all the hoopla, it really came as a bit of a shock. It was nonsense, really. The quote, you know, the, the headline, the prime minister's son lost in the desert. And he said, because we weren't lost. I mean, I knew where we were. It's just that no one else did. <laughs> that was the problem. You lot lost us, which means you people lost us. You were 30 miles off course, his sister told him. He's like, it's not that simple. The point is you make your own route. <laughs> and the sister's like, hey, the driver didn't seem too happy. She almost died of heat stroke. They had to take her to the hospital. And he's like, you're just being overdramatic. And here's the crazy part. His dad actually showed up. Um, Margaret Thatcher's husband showed up and, <laughs> and told him off as soon as he saw him. And Mark Thatcher was like, why'd you tell me off? He was like, well, I thought you should have shown a little more gratitude to the, the rescue team. And then Margaret Thatcher's like, why? It was their job, wasn't it? It took a week. What a farce. And then it goes from there. Breaks down even more and even more. What's my point in saying all this? Obviously, love the crown. I'm not endorsing it. I'm not endorsing all of it. Here's my point in saying all this. When somebody greets their rescuer with indifference... They're lost. They're truly lost. And today, we're actually going to talk about a cosmic rescue. Jesus, who showed up on the scene 2,000 years ago to accomplish a rescue that the world needed, whether or not the world is aware of it. And we're going to see two different breathtaking responses to Jesus. Mark Thatcher's response to his, to his uh, rescuers is pretty breathtaking. And in this story, we're going to see two different ones that are actually equally breathtaking for totally different reasons. So go ahead and grab your Bibles. We're going to dive in into this part of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. This is a very familiar story. It's the story of the wise men coming with gifts to King Jesus. If you've been a part of the church for any length of time, Even if you haven't, you've probably heard this story on more than one occasion. It's very, very familiar. So I'm going to ask you to just kind of suspend your understanding of the story, or just hold it very loosely. Uh, There's a bunch of things in here that I actually thought were super interesting. Like, for example, how many wise men are there? We don't know. Yep. (laughs) The general uh, confusion in the room is matched by the fact that it's vague. We don't know. In my, when I grew up, it was like there's three of them, and we had names for them. Balthazar, Melchior, and something else. I don't remember. But there was very clearly three of them, and they, they were there with the shepherds. And actually, over the course of time, like, scholars have figured out, like, we don't know how many there were. And they were actually there, like, way after the shepherds. So there's all these things that we assume about this story that actually aren't probably true. And there's something here that I've missed after reading this story so many times that I just want to point out to you guys this morning. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, Jesus, long-awaited Savior for all people, is born, and right away there's trouble. So let's read. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born King of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, He was deeply disturbed. And here's one dude that you do not want feeling any feelings. We're going to talk about him next week. And all of Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Messiah would be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they told him. Because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, and the light of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Because out of you will come a ruler 
who will shepherd my people Israel. Who's that? Mm -hmm. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, hey, go and search carefully for the child. When you go find him, report back to me so that I too can go and worship him. And that was not the truth. He had his own plans, which we'll get into next week. But that's what he told them. And at that point, I don't think they really had any reason to doubt the guy. Verse 9, after hearing the king, they went on their way. And there it was, the star they had seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped over the place, above the place where the child was. He's probably not in the manger at this point. He's, he's probably one or two years old. So they, they're just at home where the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. Entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, falling to their knees. They worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. Okay. Very familiar text for a lot of you guys. Believe it or not, there was stuff that surprised me as I did my, my research and my study into this. What surprised me about this text? Okay. The key players actually kind of surprised me. Herod, we'll get to next week, but we'll start with the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes and the high priests. Who were the scribes? The scribes were essentially the interpreters of the law of Moses. They were the Bible scholars of the day, the Bible nerds. And this is, let me read a quote. By the time of the New Testament, scribes wielded significant power throughout Israel and were routinely found in in the ranks of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council. They served as the copyists of the law, which sounds really boring and kind of dull, like you're copying stuff. But this is a duty that actually involved interpreting it too. So they were not just copying the the law and all that stuff. They were actually interpreting it. So sometimes they're referred to as teachers of the law. So if you're reading the Bible, sometimes you'll find that designation too. And here's what's interesting. These are the dudes, if there was a specific situation that came up where there was no law... Guess who it was that actually created the precedent for how to handle that? It was these guys. It was the scribes. So they had a lot of power and a lot of influence over the people. And so they wanted to make sure, this was their job during the New Testament period, they wanted to make sure that every Jewish man, woman, young person, child was acquainted with what the law required, with all the rules and all the regulations. That was their their jam. And they also served in a judicial capacity because they passed sentence in the Jewish court. So they... They were just everywhere. Like they had massive, massive influence. And their knowledge of and skill in interpreting the law made them candidates to be judges. Kind of like a Supreme Court justice and also like a Bible scholar. I mean, it's just like that. You're, it's, it's heavy and weighty. And that was the scribes. And now the chief priests were actually, they were themselves were incredible people too. So they were the highest spiritual leaders of Israel. And they oversaw the temple sacrifices and other ceremonies. They were supposed to represent God to the people and the people to God. That was their jam. This is like the people who were in charge of the Bible and the courts in a sense, and then also people who were in charge of worship, which in that culture was a big deal, worship leaders. So if anybody really should have been running to Bethlehem when the Messiah was born, it would be these guys, you would think, right? You would think so. They were involved in, they served the community, they were seen as leaders, they carried authority, and it's sort of, as I was thinking about it, it, it's the situation is so ridiculous that it was like, I need something. And I think this might make sense to some of you guys. So you know that there is a whole branch of biblical study called eschatology. There's people that really get, and eschatology is great. It's wonderful. It's in the Bible. It's an understanding of the end times, like what's coming. We did a whole series uh, a couple of years ago on this. That was, I, I, like, I liked it. <laughs> I enjoyed it. And uh, you may not know this, but there are people who are like all about the end times to the point where it's like, that's, we talk about the end times more than we talk about anything else. What's going to happen? What's the timeline? When is this person going to show up? What does this mean? Et cetera, et cetera. Does anybody, do you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a whole subculture within Christianity that's like end times, end times, end times. Imagine if you had people like that alive when Jesus returned. Okay, think about that. What would you expect that to be like? Frenzy? Uh, airplanes going to wherever <laughs> the Messiah is, you know, to the whatever. 
depending on your understanding of, of eschatology, right? That's what you would expect. Frenzy, passion, just this sense of Jesus is here and we're going to go worship him. Now imagine if that happened and the end times people were like, we'll see. It, anyone else feel like the shock? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. That's what happened here. The scribes and the high priests put their hands in their pockets and were like, we'll see. It was the arrival of the Messiah, the rescuer of Israel was met with indifference. This is a tragedy. Have you ever thought about this? Like really deeply, profoundly thought about this. It's a complete and utter tragedy. It's like the failure of humanity in a picture that I just can't... It's, almost, it's, like, Mark, it's like Mark Thatcher. Effective for all intents and purposes. Rescued and completely and utterly indifferent. And they responded by staying put, essentially. Imagine if you're in a situation where you are in the middle of the ocean. I'm actually a really bad swimmer, little known fact. Uh, I, I've almost drowned uh, off the coast of Laguna Beach. Uh, at one point in my life. So I'm, I'm really quite happy to be alive uh, <laughs> at this point. And my kids are in tr- deep trouble. Heather's, yeah, the two of us together. Um, that's why we do swim lessons. That's why what Cassie does is so important. So, um, so I'm not a good swimmer. And imagine if I'm drowning. I actually almost drowned off the coast of Laguna Beach once. Imagine if there was one of those little life buoys was just thrown out to me. And I'm just kind of like, We'll see. (laughs) I would not have done that because the way I got out was way more painful. But that's what we're talking about here. So what does that tell me? I've had time to think about this this week. I made four observations. I'm going to share them with you briefly. Number one, people who respond to their rescue with indifference don't understand their true condition. They don't get it. They don't appreciate the danger that they're in. Think about Mark Mark Thatcher and the danger that that dude was in. He was actually like his, his uh, the, the woman who was driving that car was like, we were two days away from death. And he's like reading books. He's on holiday. There's no appreciation for the danger that they're in. They don't take responsibility for how they got there. Another observation that I made as I was chewing on this text. Jesus came for a reason. Not just for the world, but for the insiders, for the family that had gone astray. And they didn't admit their own brokenness. What was missing? Like a staggering sense of taking a, like there was no step towards Jesus whatsoever. There was nothing. What's my point in saying all this? I've I've got a point, but this is almost like a little, this is a bit of an aside, but it's not really an aside. It's people who appear to be on track can sometimes be lost. People who appear to be on track can sometimes be totally lost. Merry Christmas, everybody. It's going to get better. The flip side, the Magi. Okay. They are the, mad, the three, so maybe you've heard them described as the three wise men, which is not, there's not three of them. We actually don't know how many there are. Or, or the kings, the three kings. In my uh, culture in Puerto Rico, that's, we call them the Los Tres Reyes Magos. Magos is Magi. That's where it comes from. The three wise men. And they were really remarkable people. I'm going to read something to you guys real quick. Who were they? So these were these magi, they, they came from the east, and they arrived in Jerusalem, and they were looking for King Jesus, the king of the Jews. They didn't know who he was. And the term magi, magos, is the same, it's where we get magician from. And so they were a priestly group of people from ancient Persia, and they were followers of Zoroaster, a, t- a Persian teacher and prophet. What does that mean? Okay, so over the course of time, so you had, they, they believed in, they were followers of Zoroaster, and they also added all of these different Babylon, Babylonian elements into their practice, which included astrology, demonology, wisdom, and magic. That's who these dudes were. These are not exactly practices the Bible's like, yeah, go do that. Quite the opposite. 
So magi, by the time that we're, you know, that they show up here, they were, they were leading figures in some areas. In their country of origin, they would have been like advisors to royalty. So they were trusted. And so that they employed a variety of scientific, so astrology, they studied the stars. They were, diplom- they were diplomats, and they were religious leaders. They were, they were unique people. And so, like, how do they know about this? How do they know about Jesus? How, how do they get informed on, like, what's happening here? What happened most likely is that my PDF disappeared. What happened most likely is that they were Jewish people actually living in the area that they're from. And so they probably have heard different things. They've probably heard Jewish prophecy in their area, in their land from Jewish people. Uh, It looks like they might have traveled something around like 900 miles. We don't know exactly where they came from, but 900 miles is a long way. Uh, In that time, they didn't have cars. There were no planes. This would have taken quite a while. How far were the scribes and the priests? Does anybody know, roughly? Yeah, it's like from where I live in Temecula, probably to Murrieta. Somewhere further up the road a little bit. They're like six miles away. So 900 divided by six is 150. I like math sometimes. They were 150 times farther away from Jesus. And they're the ones who show up. It's the pagan astrologers who show up. Not the scribes, not the priests. What am I saying? Sometimes people who appear to be lost can actually be on the path to life. Sometimes people who appear to be lost can be on the path to life. Things, and this is my first point, if you're taking notes, things are not always as they appear to be. Credit to uh, Pete Scazzaro from, whatever, he's a writer. And he, he said this, and I liked it. People who, are on, who appear to be on track are sometimes lost, and people who appear to be lost are sometimes on the path of life. Matthew 21, 28 to 32. So this is later on in the story. I think Jesus uses this parable to kind of illustrate some of what's going on here. It says this. What do you think? This is Jesus teaching. He's telling us a quick story to teach a point. A man had two sons. Two sons. Think the royal scribe, the scribes and the, and the chief priests and think magi for a second. He went to the first and said, my son, go into the vineyard today. And he answered, I don't want to. But he later changed his mind and went. And then the man went to the other and said the same thing. And he says, sir, I'll do it. Sure thing, sure thing, dad. But he didn't go. Which of the two did his father's will? They said, the first. And Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, and here comes the Tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. Whew. Things aren't always the way they appear to be. They didn't move towards Jesus. They didn't care. They were indifferent. And we've, I've seen this in my own life. Sometimes the people who are most zealous for scripture are the hardest to reach. Hear me out. I want to be zealous for scripture. As a church, I want all of us to have a really good understanding of Scripture because that's, that's how we primarily are going to experience God is through his word, through his spirit, but his spirit is going to reveal Jesus in line with his word. So I'm like for being zealous, but I'm letting you know right now, knowing a lot of Scripture doesn't mean much. It doesn't. I know in my own life, I've had, I've had experiences. Heather's not, she, she had to walk out with, she's got Ellie but I had an experience for a, for a while in my life where I was learning scripture at a rate that I never had before, actually. So I'm already a disciple. I'm already a Christian at this point. And I just go through like two years of just intensive Bible scripture study. And I, I didn't realize how much of it was also wrapped up in like kind of human traditions too. So there was scripture I was learning. And then I was also learning like a very specific human tradition and I've, I can say this, and I'm, there's no, I'm not happy to say this, but I think that was the hardest my heart's ever been as a disciple in that time. I remember talking to Heather in ways that were demeaning to her and to her church that I didn't want to be a part of. I looked down on people. I talked badly about other Christians. I was divisive. And I was, in a sense... 
more learned than I had ever been. Again, my point isn't to scare anyone off from reading the Bible. I'm just letting you know that reading the Bible and studying it doesn't mean much of anything. Unless it's accompanied with some things that we'll talk about later in this message. So number one, things aren't always as they appear to be. I have a second observation from this text. Second thing that I want to share with you guys. The the scribes and the chief priests, I kind of think of them as, as royals because the scriptures talk about how the people of Israel were, were a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So they were priests, essentially. And this goes all the way back to the garden, to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were priests in God's garden. They were representatives of God in the world. Israel was called to be God's representatives in the world, represent God to people and people to God. And this is what royals do. And these royals, they, they would refuse to admit that they needed rescue. That's the second thing. You're taking notes. Like lost royals refuse to admit that they need rescue. Matthew 23, 23 to 28. I'm going to read it real fast. And I like to give a little bit of a background here. The scribes at this point, this is a generation after Jesus showed up. So the indifference that we see at first, it actually progresses and becomes something way more sinister. And these are Jesus' words to them. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay a tenth of mint, dill, and cumin, and yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These things you should have done without neglecting the others. Blind guides, you strain out a gnat but gulp down a camel. You care about really little insignificant things and you don't care about the big things. Then it goes on. Blind Pharisees, you clean the outside of the cup so that the first clean the inside of the cup so the outside of it may be clean. So there's focus on external stuff. They're hypocritical. And as I was reading this and as I was thinking about this, I realized, does anybody remember going through the, the green book? If you've been in the gospel community before, you may, you've gone through the green book. Um, so when we're starting the intro to gospel communities, we go through two different books. We go through the blue book and the green book. The green book, which we'll get to guys that are in my, in my intro right now, we'll get to that in a few months, has this breakdown. So I'm just going to go through it really fast that I think it wasn't until I read this and thought about this that I was like, oh my gosh, this is describing the scribes and the chief priests. So it's six ways of minimizing sin. I think you guys should have that in the back. I'll go through it real quick. Does it look familiar to some of you guys? So this is really, really practical. This is, this is what the, lost, the way of the lost royals looks like. The way of the lost royals looks like this. This is what the scribes and the Pharisees did. When they were, the, the ways that they minimized their own sin, which in other words is another way of saying the ways they minimized their own need to be rescued, was they were defensive, they faked it, they hid, there was exaggeration. What happened? Um, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests were actually experts at deflecting and blaming other people. And then they would downplay. I don't need to be rescued. So it's difficult to receive feedback about sin or weakness when confronted, tend to explain things away, talk about successes and justify decisions. It was very hard for people to approach them. In fact, Jesus tried to approach them, and guess what happened to Jesus. They killed them. So this, is, this goes deep. This goes really deep. There's faking, there's pretending and performing, essentially, to when it comes down to it. And how many pe- <laughs> what's the most common way that people outside the church describe the church today? Fake. Hypocrites. And Jesus is basically like, this is the stuff that he was most opposed to. And that this is kind of what the church is known for, broadly speaking. So it leads me to believe some, like one thing is, is happening. We're missing Jesus in the midst of, of this. You guys ever thought about the Christmas story this way before? I hadn't. Straight up, I'd never seen this until this week. So what's the cash value of all of this? Which is in the green book, if you guys have it. Those of you guys that aren't, haven't gone through it yet. We'll go through it. If you want a copy of this, I can get it to you. 
but we're going to keep moving here. What's the cash value in all this? Lost royals deny that they are even in need of rescue. That's where the rubber meets the road. They would say, I'm not the problem, you are. I wasn't lost, you lot lost us. Inattentive and indifference lead to them not seeing the condition of their own soul. But just as the ignorance of cancer doesn't make it any better, it just allows it to spread and do great harm, kind of in the same way if we're indifferent to the condition of our soul, it could become so widespread that it becomes inoperable, which is actually what we see with the scribes and the high priests, a lot of them, which is tragic. They end up killing Jesus. It's, it's a tragedy because he came to rescue people from that. I heard this quote as I was prepping this message that I thought was so insightful. This is from Tim Keller. He says, if you don't crown Jesus, you'll crucify him. If you don't crown him, you'll crucify him. That's exactly what we see with the high priest. But how does it start? What was their response to the rescue? I'm fine. We'll never reach out for rescue if we don't admit that we're lost. Straight up. We just won't. We'll become like that dad that won't ask for directions. Anybody had that dad? (laughs) Anybody ever been that dad? (laughs) Oh, I love you, puppy. I miss you. Um, He's not dead, by the way. He's just in Puerto Rico. (laughs) He's in Puerto Rico. But my dad just wouldn't ask for directions. Um, It's... uh, we went to Six Flags. We, we got there, eventually. With pre-GPS. Um, he just wouldn't ask for directions. It's like, Dad, you don't know where you're going. <laughs> uh, this isn't supposed to be funny, but it is. It's, like, it's so ridiculous. You're lost, and you're refusing to admit it, and you're actually putting us in danger now. Because <laughs> we're lost in the wrong part of... Uh, where, where's Six Flags? Valencia. You don't want to get lost in Valencia. <laughs> but, but, but hang with me for a second. It really is easier to pretend that you know where you're going and to say that everyone else is lost. It's just easier to say that. It's easier to be a Mark Thatcher. Here's the problem, though. It does you no good if you are, in fact, lost. Check this out. Mark Thatcher's crewmates... We're feeling the strain of the situation. Uh, the driver told the BBC, hey, the thing I didn't get is that Mark could not find where we were. <laughs> With all the machines, he said, I can't find where we are. <laughs> That's the thing that made me angry. It's just so ridiculous. The mechanic was also less than impressed. We found ourselves about 200 kilometers from where we should have been. We were totally lost. And he was left wondering why Thatcher was attempting to navigate using only a compass. Can you put the Africa? (laughs) A compass. Gosh, if it wasn't so tragic, it would just, it'd be funny. It kind of is. But this is the way of the lost royals. This is the way of human beings made in the image of God who were meant to be his representatives on the earth who choose their own path ridiculous, but we do it <laughs> to some degree or another. It's, that's, that's our inheritance. If you've never read the story of Adam and Eve, what do Adam and Eve do after they're caught in their sin? Yep. What else do they do? They hide? Blame. Yeah. They start pointing fingers elsewhere, right? That's what the scribes and the chief priests do. That's what we all do if we're completely honest with ourselves. We blame, we, we just don't want to be rescued. But, one last Mark Thatcher thing. The situation, it developed into an international incident. Help was at hand, though, and with the extensive, extensive search effort eventually paying off six days after they had gone missing. Which again, six, like that's excruciating. 
I remember when um, Hurricane Maria hit. I don't know if you guys remember Hurricane Maria back in 2017. It basically, it looked like a, a nuclear bomb had been dropped on my island after I went to go see it. It was just like vast parts of it were just gone. After Maria hit, the intensity of the wind and the, all of it actually blew out all the telecommunications on the island. So I was on the phone trying to call my mom and dad, and I didn't get through to them for over a week. Nothing. You ever been in a situation where you've been waiting to find out if someone's alive or not, or if someone's okay? It's hard. It's really hard to wait. It's painful. And it speaks of how serious the situation is. And so, eventually, two days from death, Mark Thatcher and his crew were spotted. And the files on Downing Street, which I think is just another way of saying like the Prime Minister's office in the UK, confirmed that it took four Algerian airplanes, one helicopter, three French aircraft, and a diverted RAF Hercules to rescue them. And he responded with indifference. When that happened, though, what do you think happened to Mark Thatcher after that? Anybody know? Anybody like a big buff of this? No, that's fine. Um, his life got, got worse when he responded to that rescue with indifference. The events of 1982 were perhaps a little embarrassing, this is a quote, but they were to be overshadowed in the subsequent years. He was a part of like a really sketchy arms deal that put weapons into the hands of people that should not have had weapons, should not have been supported by um, foreign governments. And he was accused of using his mother's position to improve his own finances. His most serious misdemeanor, get this, this blew my mind. He was convicted in South Africa in 2005 because he was a part of a failed coup to overthrow a government in Equatorial Guinea. It didn't get better. It got worse. And it was exactly the same for the chief priests and the scribes. When they responded with indifference, things only got worse. They ended up crucifying Jesus. And that's really broken. When lost royals refuse to admit they need to be rescued, things get worse. I had an experience this week that I thought was, uh, it was interesting, isn't it the right word? It was uh, sobering. I was uh, talking to Heather I think it was on uh, Friday or Saturday. And it became very clear as we talked, had this conversation, that I had, to put it nicely, I had um, just missed the mark on Christmas. I hadn't really prepared. I hadn't really done anything uh, for anybody else. I was just kind of like in this self-focused mode of like, I'm just taking care of me and what I need to do this week. And on Christmas morning, (laughs) it's like, oh, there's a lot of work that went into this. Uh, this is like, this is a huge ordeal to actually put on uh, Christmas for children, for family, and all that stuff. And I had this moment where I realized, oh, I didn't, I didn't really do hardly anything for my family. And as we started to talk about it, it you know, like it, it, it became clear. And you know what I actually did? Uh, I turned the lights off in the room. I was like, what's that? I didn't want to talk about it. I did not want to talk about it. I literally shut the lights off so that I didn't have to deal with the consequences of my decisions and my choices and my actions. And you know what I was doing? I was essentially like Adam and Eve, like covering myself. I didn't want to be exposed. It took some work and some real like self-reflection, but I realized like there's this deep thing of like, I don't want to acknowledge that sometimes I just can't do, I don't do things right. Sometimes I just mess up. There are moments where I feel like I blow things and it touches this deep thing that's like I'm defective, I'm broken. And instead of actually acknowledging that, I turn the light off. I was like, oh, I can't, let's not talk about this anymore. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I realized in that moment I was refusing to admit that I needed to be rescued. I needed a covering. But here's the good news, and this is my third point. There actually is good news in this message. Grace is for everyone who admits they need rescue. Grace is for everyone who admits that they need rescue. 
It's for people that say, I'm lost. Can you help me find my way? Which I love because the Magi actually stopped and asked for directions. They had traveled far and they were like, we're not going to stop until we find them. And they knew something. All that spirituality, all the practices that they had, all of their magic, all of their understanding, it didn't lead to true life or wisdom. It was all found in him. It was all found in Jesus. I'm going to read a few verses. Psalm 72, verses 10 to 15. I think at one point Tom was like, hey, let's have fun with cross-references. Anybody remember that? On one Sunday? Let's have fun with cross-references. This is a fun one. Psalm 72, 10 to 15. It says this. We've got it. We don't have it. Sorry, just listen. It's going to be good. Let the kings of Tarshish, Tarshish and the islands bring tribute. This is a passage that talks about Israel's coming deliverer, coming Messiah. And this is centuries before Jesus shows up. Let the kings of Sheba and Seba present gifts. Let all the kings bow down to him. Let all the nations serve him. Indeed, he will deliver the needy who is crying out for help and the afflicted who has no helper. He will take pity on the helpless and the needy and all the lives of the needy he will save. From oppression and from violence, he will redeem their lives and their blood will be precious in his eyes. So may he live and may gold from Sheba. What did the, uh, the wise men bring? They brought gold. May the gold from Sheba be given to him and may prayers be offered for him continually. May blessings be invoked for him all the day long. What is that saying? What's that promise? That Jesus, the Messiah, will rescue the poor people who cry out to him. You don't have to be poor financially, although that could be a part of it. It's, it's a poverty of spirit. Those who understand that they're broken in need of rescue. He loves to rescue those who acknowledge they need to be rescued. To redeem them from oppression, from violence. And obviously we deal with oppression of sin that oppresses all of us. And there's situations where people do deal with oppression as well. Of other kinds. But the point is the same. Jesus loves to rescue. He's the deliverer who was sent for a purpose, for a reason. The stakes were really high. Mark Thatcher, one more time. That race, the Paris to Dakar rally, there's been dozens of people who actually died during that race. Not that shocking when you look at the map of North Africa and all that stuff. It's not, not crazy to think that people would die. The founder and the organizer of it died of that race. The stakes were super high. And Jesus came to the rescue for us. The stakes couldn't have been higher for us as his people. I mentioned Adam and Eve earlier. What happens to Adam and Eve after they start blaming and hiding and they cover themselves? What does God do? What does he, what does he say to them? What does he promise? He promises someone who's going to come and do what? To the snake. Crush. Yes. You guys, it's okay to answer. Crush. It's a good word. Crush. Not just for baseball. It's the crushing of the snake. And God says, he is going to step on the serpent's head, which is a deadly blow, and he's going to, the snake is actually going to also take a swipe at the Messiah who's going to come. So that same Messiah who crushed the head of the serpent was actually taken out himself for us and for our sins. And what does God do to kind of prefigure that? He takes some animals, sacrifices them in a sense, and what does he do with the skins of Adam and Eve? He clothes them. When I was in my bed, turning the lights off, hiding, not wanting to deal with the reality that I had messed up, I was looking for cover. And I was hiding. But the reality, the good news is that Jesus covers us. He covers our shame. That's what he came to do. He came to help those who are needy and broken and hurting and to cover the shame that we carry because of our sin. He's our covering. He's our joy. And I know this message, like there's lots of parts of it that are like kind of intense, but what does it say about the Magi when they found Jesus? What was their response? Joy. Awe. Indifference on the one hand and then awe and wonder on the other hand. 
So we're going to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to call the band up. And we're going to do something that is going to feel maybe a little bit different to some of you guys, but this is something that Christians do, which is to use their imagination to enter into the story. I want you to imagine for a moment that you are going to visit Jesus, the babe. If it helps you, you can close your eyes. If you don't want to close your eyes, you don't have to. But I want you to imagine that you are with the caravan with the Magi. And I want you to imagine traversing 900 miles of desert, of sand, of heat, of cold. I want you to imagine going to Herod's palace and saying, hey, he's five miles away. Go find him. Report back to me. Imagine that, that joy, that expectation, that kind of sense of delight. We're almost there. We're in Temecula and we need to get to Murrieta. It's like right there. And I want you to imagine now that you're following a star, which I didn't even really touch on. A whole other thing that we could talk about another day. Signs in the heavens and you see the sign and it camps out over a little house. A very humble house. Nothing special about it. But it's God's way of saying, here you are. What, how might you feel? The long expected Messiah, the one who came to rescue his people, is in that house. And now you walk through the open door and you see Mary, the mother, with the babe. And he's one or two years old. Let's say he's, let's say he's a toddler. And you look over and these important, dignified, wise men fall on their faces and start to weep tears of joy. And so you fall. Maybe you fall because oh, this is what's expected or maybe you yourself are like excited. And you see them, let's assume there's three of them for fun. Gold, frankincense, myrrh. Which one scholar called this cash. Imagine if just a bunch of cash is laid at Jesus' feet. And then it's, it's you, and you have your hands open. What's in your hands? What's in your hands? What are you giving to him? What do you give to Jesus? And how do you feel about it? I know for me, I did this this week, and I had to hand him my shame. I had to hand him the hiding the broken way of the royals that I was following. I handed it to him. And I felt freer and lighter. What is it for you? Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's a gift. What is it that you need to give him? Here's what I discovered. You give and you get back so much more. He's the one who rescues lost royals and restores them to family, to be the family of God. And how does he do that? He calls people to follow him. Come, go, and, go into the nations, teach them to obey everything I commanded. And as we learn to obey him and trust him and receive his love and forgiveness, we are made new people. So I'm gonna ask you to stand. I just want to ask the question, like, what's your next step as a disciple? For some of you, you just need to rejoice and sing. And sing with, like, kind of reckless abandon. It's totally okay. Uh, for others of you, I actually think there's an opportunity to repent. To, like, change your mind about how you've been navigating through life. Maybe as a lost royal. Embracing the ways of Jesus to set you free. And I have something here. We were reading this book called The Little Pilgrim's Big Journey. We got that for Christmas for the kids. And there's a story in here about a little boy whose name is Eli. And Eli was in a garden and he wasn't supposed to actually eat the fruit in the garden. Does this sound familiar? And he ate the fruit because he thought, it looks beautiful, it looks wonderful, 
It tasted sweet, and he ate it, and Eli thought, I was right, this is the best fruit I've ever tasted. And the story says, the sweetness lasted only for a moment. It became terribly bitter in Eli's stomach. There's another character named Mercy who asks, Eli, what did you do? And the children, they all ran to Eli. There's a bunch of kids, and they're on their way to this city, the celestial city. And Eli has fallen. Because they were told, don't eat that, and he ate it. Mercy said, quick, run and tell Goodwill. Another character, what happened? Maybe he has a remedy. Goodwill shows up, this person, and he kneels beside Eli and he says, I have medicine here that's come at great cost to the king. Goodwill put some medicine in a spoon and said, this medicine is called truth. It's going to taste bitter, but you got to take it. Eli nearly spat it out. He's like, this tastes awful. Well, that's only because of the golden apple. The truth tastes bitter to those who have believed lies. And I think it's important to recognize that every single one of us has believed lies. To one point or another about who we are, about what matters in life, about who Jesus is. But goodwill, the story's not done. Goodwill gave him another medicine. This one is called grace. Take it and eat. It will turn the bitter to sweet. It will turn the bitter to sweet. So there's this reality today that as we repent, it's bitter. It's not fun to say, like, I was wrong. It's not, it's not fun to say, like, I've been trying to cover my own nakedness and shame on my own, and I've not wanted to be rescued. It's not fun to do that. It's bitter. But he gives us grace, which turns sweet. So some of you may need to repent and confess, and some of you guys may need to receive prayer. And if the, tra- the prayer team can go out into the back, there's going to be people there that would love to pray for you. So we're going to sing, some of us. I encourage you to go get prayer. And then Tom will be up in a little bit with next steps.
There's no place I would rather be. No place I would rather be, Lord. No place I would rather be. And here in your love, here in your love. There's no place I would rather be, Lord. There's no place I'd rather be. And here in your love, Lord. No place I would rather be. There's no Take a seat. Um, we desire to um, not just create but sustain a culture of honor. And so before I kind of wrap things up, I just think it's really appropriate um, to honor you, Herrick. The week of Christmas, um, there's a lot going on, and you vulnerably shared some of the stuff that, you know, your, your own shortcomings and how you approach Christmas with your family, and, and nobody's perfect but that was a profound message, bro. And you served us. Uh, I think, I think all of us know what it is like to kind of mail it in sometimes in the thing that we, things that we give ourselves to, whether it's um, our relationships or our responsibilities or our careers or our jobs or our school or, um, and you did not mail it in you sought the Lord and you shepherded us this morning in a profound way. So I want to honor you and the rest of us honor you. Thank you for serving us, bro. Profound. Um, And there's something that I feel like the Spirit's highlighting for all of us. And I think it's joy. I think it's joy. And I think if you're anything like me, my attention is is like, it, 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 I'm constantly looking for things that will bring me joy. And sometimes it's things that, you know, they're like the big thing where you're like, oh, like the big, like even like Christmas morning, like the big gift, you know, like when you're five and you get the bike and you're like, oh my gosh, you know, that's different than socks. <clears throat> sometimes it's the big thing in life that you think is going to give you joy. Sometimes it's the uh, approval of a, a specific person or a specific uh, group of people. Our hearts like are constantly, we're like constantly looking and reaching out for joy. We're on the march. Like we're literally seeking it out in all these different ways and all these different areas and all these different things. You're just like me. You do it too. And I feel like in a fresh way, 
through your preach, dude. I feel like God gave me like the recipe for joy. And it's so elementary and it's so basic and all of you know it. It's simple. But it's this idea of being aware of your condition. The thing that we run from the most, the hiding piece, we, want, we actually don't want to come to grips with the reality of where, where things are really at. Like what's really going on in my heart. And we distract ourselves and we escape and we run or we deny, we're indifferent. And that is in and of itself not quite enough to produce joy. It's the, it's the, it's the pathway. Being, becoming aware of our condition, what's really going on in me at a soul level. That awareness met with rescue, actually receiving Jesus' rescue. He clothes us like, like Herrick talked about. What does he clothe us with? What does he clothe us with? He clothes our shame. With what? His righteousness. Yeah. His rightness, despite our wrongness. Guys, can I just leave you with one thing? Can you just, next time you're tempted to seek joy in fill in the blank. It's not that it's necessarily a bad thing. It could be a wonderful thing. Maybe, instead of doing that, would you try drinking deeply from the well of the grace and the love of God for you in Christ Jesus? Him. His body, His blood, His life, His incarnation for you. Why? To bring you joy. It looks counterintuitive. It looks backwards. It, like that story, I need to get that children's book, that is fire, of like the first taste of the truth is bitter, man. Oh gosh, I'm actually a mess. <laughs> oh, I'm actually not impressive. I'm actually not as cool as I want to be. I'm actually not as gifted as I'd like to be. I'm not as impressive. All the things, right? Like, oh crap. But then the grace and the mercy and the love of God to cover and clothe us with perfection. When God the Father sees you, do you know what he sees? He sees you in such a way that you're flawless. You could not bring him any more joy than you currently do, even in your broken state. Do you see that? That will bring you joy. Drink deeply from the well, man, and let your thirst be satisfied. Ladies, will you come join me for a second? There's one more thing that we feel like God is highlighting, wants to meet with someone or some ones specifically, and the ladies are going to share that with you now. Morning, guys. Um, so Lisa and I wanted to share, this is us stepping out in faith and obedience, guys. Um, this morning, we both experienced lower back pain at the same time. We don't live together. <laughs> and... and we both got the sense that it was for somebody. Um, and while Herrick was preaching, this just came to mind regarding it. Um, if we don't get help for our pain, our physical pain, it will get worse. Um, and we need to be rescued. Even from our physical ailments, we need to be rescued. And sometimes we just muscle through it, like we're gonna be fine, it's okay, this is my cross to bear. I'm just going to have this forever or whatever it is. But God is looking down at us, seeing his kids limping along, saying, it's okay, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> and he wants to love us and heal us in that way. So if you've never asked for healing before, also we specifically got the back, your lower back. However, I really believe this is for any physical healing. If you've never asked for physical healing before, um, now is the time. We won't see a miracle if we never ask for it. And if you've asked for prayer for this many times and not seen it, um, now is the time to come and get prayer. Um, we trust that God has a plan for his path for us. Um, and sometimes that is 
asking over and over again. And this is a way that we love each other as a family. So we come together and ask for each other. So, um, yeah, and Lisa had something else to share. Yeah, and um, thank you, Heidi. Um, with the back pain, I kept hearing the words, I'm slipping. Um, and while we were singing that song where it says, I am yours, um, I feel like there's even like an understanding in that that God wants to solidify in your heart that you are his. Um, maybe there's like a doubting that, um, but him specifically seeing you or many of you, um, that he, he calls you his. So we would love to pray for you. Thank you. If God's highlighting you this morning, he wants to meet with you in a really personal way, Okay. And so Heidi and Lisa will be over off to the side. <clears throat> Please don't go without receiving, okay? Let me pray for us and we'll close it out. What is it about this season, Jesus, that just makes it always feel so busy? Spirit, would you guide us and lead us? to slow down enough to become aware of our condition so that we can become aware of your grace and your love so that we can actually discover who we are and we can experience the joy that you purchased for us with your blood. Help us. Help us experience what you have secured for us. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for your presence this morning. Amen. Love you guys very much. Wow. Oh, cool. There are magnets and ornaments in the back if you haven't got a magnet or an ornament. No be do. Put it on your fridge. I'm fired up about that. Love you guys so much. So, so much. Enjoy your Sunday.